Come on, everybody, open your mouth and worship the Lord. He's worthy of the glory. He deserves the praise today. Come on, everybody, all over the room, open your mouth and worship him. Lift your hands and bless him in this place. Simple song. Goes like this. My hallelujah belongs to you. Oh Lord, my hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. My hallelujah. Sing it, y'all. Come on, y'all got it. Come on, say, my hallelujah. My hallelujah to you. From the bottom of your heart, lift your voice. My hallelujah. My hallelujah Simple say it, church. From the bottom of your heart, tell the Lord. You deserve it, Lord. Yeah. Now say, all of the glory. Everything I give you, Lord. Everything I owe you, Lord. It belongs to you. Y'all got it now. Come on, say it. All of the glory. So Father, we come to you today thanking you for allowing us to see another day. We thank you for grace and mercy. We thank you for love and kindness. And as we get ready to go into today's devotional, we ask that you would open up our heart, open up our ears and our minds so that we can receive what you have for us. We thank you for even this time of studying and sharing. And we thank you that we are becoming closer to you. We thank you for every opportunity that you give us to not only love you, but to love people. These blessings and all others we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who don't have the right not to work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes. This was written for us. Because when farmers plow and thresh, they should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rites, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not misuse my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize.
because every other God is impersonal. Right? If you're a Muslim or were a Muslim, and you, and you do Hajj and you pray five times to the east per day, to Allah, the goal is simply to please Allah. But Allah is not personal. Allah does not talk to you. Tammuz is not personal. Mithra wasn't personal. Dagon wasn't personal. The Egyptian gods, as much as we talk about them and you hear them on the internet and cats out there trying to be woke, talking about Isis and Osiris and Horus and Amun and Ka and Kephra and all of these. Listen, none of these gods are personal, though. Right. And the whole vibe is that Christianity came as a copycat of these pagan religions. No, it didn't. The number one difference is that you're talking about impersonal gods versus a personal one. Not even the Greek gods, the culture in which they lived, Apollo, Zeus, Aphrodite, none, none, of these were, none of these were personal gods. Not even the East Indian gods, not Brahma, not Vishnu, not Shiva, not Krishna. N not, none of these gods are personal. Mankind's attempt is always to approach an unseen God to get his favor or to please him or to get him to like them or to get his favor. That's not Christianity. John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Ooh, he became personal. Every other religion teaches that if you want to get into heaven or, or you know, whatever that paradise is, that you have to do so many things in so many ways and all that kind of stuff, and then maybe God will let you in. That's not what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches that you will never, ever, ever be good enough in order to reach God. So what God does is he comes down and reaches down to man, pulls man up to God. No other religion teaches that. And for John, that is a cataclysmic event. It is what separates this from every other system of belief in God ever to exist. So John says, the word became flesh. And he was full of grace and truth. So Jesus says, um, that disciples, one of the characteristics of disciples is that we love one another. But not only do we love one another, but we love one another based upon how he has loved us. And so love cannot be self-defined, so Jesus says. Um, and then the question becomes, how does Jesus love? How does he, how does he love? And so one of the things that we looked at inside of the, the text is that Jesus' love to us looks four particular ways. Um, if you just watch him, watch his interactions, watch his relationships, his love will look four ways to us, right? As we see it, it looks four different ways. It will look messy, uh, it will look inconsistent, it will look unfair, and it will look confusing. If you just watch how he does, he doesn't, it's interesting, when he interacts with people, he'll um, he'll take somebody who is the worst of sinners and be kind to them and then take someone else who hasn't done what the worst person has done and be very, very hard with them. Um, and, and when you look at how he interacts and you look at his love, it seems to be one of these four things or sometimes all four of these things to us when we, when we look at it from, from afar. And so what we looked at was this, that Jesus tells us to love. How does he tell us to love? He tells us to love the way he loves us. How does he love us? How does he love us? He loves us with grace and truth. Right? And so well, here's what we learned. Real love looks like grace and truth combined. Grace 
can only be found when someone is willing to get on your level and feel what you feel and then think their way out from your perspective. Truth, people, how do you get more grace? Simple. You have to be willing to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and you have to be willing to feel what they feel, not feel what you would feel if you were in their shoes. You have to be willing to, you have to be willing to study them enough, love them enough, to study them enough to know what's happening inside of them so that now that they're in this situation, when you put yourself in this situation, you know what it feels like to be them. And then you have to figure out how do you pull yourself out being them, looking at things from their perspective. This is why the word becoming flesh is a cataclysmic event for John. Because what John said is literally this. What God was not content with was sitting in heaven far removed from everything we have to deal with and go through. And what he was willing to do was he was willing to kneel down and put himself in our position and feel what we feel, go through what we go through, see what we see, deal with what we deal with, and then deal with us from our own perspective. That's why he's full of grace and truth.